Well, friends, it's very good to see you again. I trust that you're refreshed after some lunch. Uh, we had a, a full session last time, and I have said that these next two will be somewhat more digestible, and we will have some time, I trust, for questions. Uh, we've been thinking about preaching from the heart of the text to the heart of the hearer. We've thought about what faithfulness and authenticity look like within that. We've considered the definition of preaching, and now in this session, I want to consider what it means to preach the heart of the text. And as we prepare ourselves to think about that, I would love to pause for a moment and ask for the Lord's help that this might be a fruitful time. Our Father, what a privilege it is to have this day together. And as we enter into another session and consider the great work of preaching, we pray that you would help us by your Spirit to learn better what it means to dig into your Word, to open it up in faithfulness and with power, that Christ might be proclaimed and lives might be changed. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean to get to the heart of the text? And how do we do it? Well, let me begin by saying that if we are to preach the heart of the text, we need to be convinced that it is indeed our job to get to the heart of the text. That's my first major emphasis here, my first point, if you like. We need to be convinced that it is our job to get to the heart of the text. Just briefly, I want to comment on this. I believe that we share the belief together that God does his powerful work of transforming lives for his glory by his word and through his spirit. That's my basic conviction when it comes to ministry, and I suspect it's yours too. Let me remind you of those very, very wonderful words of Isaiah 55 and verses 10 and 11. You know them. You may have them memorized, but they are so good and they are so foundational for our subject. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. If we want to see God work powerfully in the churches represented here in this room, changing lives, producing fruit for his glory. We need to give ourselves to the ministry of the word because his word is powerful to do his work. And he is committed to working through his word. And within that, our obligation and our responsibility is not innovation. It's not novelty. It is not impressiveness. Much as we might be tempted toward all those things, no, our obligation is to faithfulness to the word that God has spoken and which he has committed himself to use. I often return in my own thinking to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 to the charge that Paul gives there, do your, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, and how we long not to be ashamed, but to be able to present ourselves to God as those approved, because we've handled the word of truth rightly. Now, all good Bible teaching begins with good Bible listening, good Bible observation. And so before ever we can be good Bible teachers, good Bible preachers, we need to be competent Bible readers and competent Bible observers. We need to hear the text before ever we can turn around and speak it. So I, I draw your attention to what Isaiah says in chapter 50 and verse 4. I think this is a, a wonderful text to have in our mind when we consider the work of ministry, the work to which he has called us. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. I think Isaiah is in the first instance referring to his own preaching ministry and, of course, in a greater fulfillment. It points to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Isaiah 50 and verse 4, he says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear. 
if the prophet is to have a ministry that will sustain others, he needs first to have heard from the Lord. Before he presumes to speak for the Lord, he must listen to the Lord. He must listen to his voice. And of course, the Lord God takes a very dim view of those who would purport to stand as his representatives and speak on his behalf, but who have not first listened to his word. It's a very serious matter that Jeremiah 23 is very, very cautionary. And I'd like, I'd like to read it for us. Jeremiah 23, not the whole chapter. I won't do that. But I'd like to read verses 16 to 22, which are quite self-explanatory. But I find them very, very sobering. Jeremiah 23, verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest, it will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. May the Lord preserve us from being those who speak not having listened. We need to listen before we speak. That is, we need to recognize our sober responsibility to get to the heart of the text. Second, we need to give ourselves to the task. Um, let me uh, share with you some images that I would commend to you that do not all uh, arise from me by, by any means. Some of these actually come from friends of the Proclamation Trust, where I served in London. Some of you will have heard of the Proclamation Trust. Some of you won't. But I served in that ministry for four years, I think, in London before coming back to Canada. And within that, there were a, a few seminal Bible teachers uh, who, had a, who had a profound impact on many, and including me. Two of them would be Dick Lucas and David Jackman. And some of these insights uh, really have their genesis in those, in those men, and I want to give them credit for it. But um, here are some images that might help us um, consider our commitment to the task. Uh, Dick Lucas famously said that we must not be water beetles as preachers. And if you can picture a water beetle that skims across the surface of the water and never seems to dip below the surface, has this amazing ability not, not seeming to sink at all as it skims across the top of the water. Can you picture that? Dick is saying we must in our preaching never be water beetles who simply skim above the surface of the text. But how much preaching is just skimming above the surface of the text, never descending into the text to see what is truly there? Don't be a water beetle. Uh, here's another one. Don't be a trampolinist. I think that's the correct word. One who jumps on a trampoline. How much preaching starts with a concern of the preacher who then opens up the, the, the Bible, as in opens up the page, but not really opening up the text, and jumps down from his concern to the text and back out to the people. And, and, and the text is there simply as a trampoline. But the text, the text is actually being used and abused, but not expounded. How much preaching is just trampolining? Have you heard trampolining preaching? I have. No, we must not be water beetles, and we must not be trampolinists. We must be miners, those who dig. And we must dig because there is treasure in the text. There, there is gold within the text. And it does take some work for us to find it in, 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 in the sense that we understand it and, and have really been transformed by it and are ready to proclaim it. There is treasure in the text, but it sometimes takes some digging. No skimming the surface, no bouncing off the text to use it for our own agenda, but mining. Now, to be minors, we need to give ourselves to the work of preaching, and we need to structure our time, shape our week, educate our congregation, 
that we will be able to give the time to the work of preaching. And I think it's worth just saying that this is very, very hard to do. I think it's worth acknowledging that. It will be helpful, I think, for us for just a brief moment here to articulate and to consider a couple of headwinds that are against us in this work, because we do have to fight to get the space and the energy and the time to give ourselves to get to the heart of the text for our preaching. There will be tremendous pressure for us just to water beetle across the the surface of the text, to skim the surface, to trampoline in and out because we're busy and we don't really have time to grapple with the text. That will be an overwhelming pressure throughout ministry, and we do have to fight against it. A couple of considerations I'll just mention, and you will be aware of your own. One is the ever-expanding mandate for the pastor. That is a significant headwind to us in this work, isn't it? Ministry has always been busy. Ministry has always been demanding. For those who would give themselves faithfully and fully to it, there's always been the danger of burnout, of exhaustion, of overwork, and all the rest. History will give us many examples of pastors who probably overexerted themselves in physical and emotional terms through their ministry and maybe burned out early. After all, if our mandate is like Paul's to proclaim Christ and to present everyone under our care perfect in Christ, Colossians 1, 28, if that is our mandate, then the job is truly never ending. And we have some sense of that, all of us, as we engage in ministry. There's always more to do, always more to do, always more need. That's always been the case, but there is the challenge of it that still confronts us. But within all that, the reality is that certain expectations have been growing for local church pastors over recent years in church ministry in many contexts. And those expectations and those priorities do tend to draw us away from the preaching of the word. And I'll mention a few, and you'll have your own managing staff. If you end up managing staff, managing budgets, keeping half an eye on a facility, considering not only in-person ministry, but online platforms becoming and remaining versed in cultural issues of the moment. I noticed Carl Truman's analysis of our cultural moment is on the table out there. It's a wonderful book. It takes some reading. I had to, I had to devote a lot of hours to reading that book to try and understand what is going on. <laughs> what is going on? It's very helpful, but that's an investment of time, isn't it? To understand the culture, to know what's really happening, to be able to speak into it, that takes time. Providing counsel for increasingly complex and tragic personal needs as the culture moves further and further downstream from some of its Judeo-Christian headwaters, we should not be surprised that things are getting worse and the needs are becoming more complex. And on and on it goes. The job can be overwhelming in its diversity and in the demands of it. And there will be a job that we have to do, a fight that we have to have, Uh, a struggle to maintain the priority of digging into the text. Second, our culture's disdain for authority. That is a significant headwind against the work of which we're speaking today. Now, disdain for authority is nothing new. It goes back to the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? And is part and parcel of the sinful nature within each one of us. We all have this tendency. But we do live in an age where the disdain for authority and skepticism surrounding leaders and leadership structures has reached now a feverish, feverish pitch. Teachers will tell you that classroom discipline is harder than it's ever been. Parents so often feel that their children are out of control. Political leaders are not to be trusted to tell the truth. We've entered an age throughout the West of a politics now of protest, where whole structures and systems in government are being cast aside as corrupt and empty. I gather that the British Prime Minister Uh, One another one has stepped aside today. Keeps happening. Millennials are a whole generation, and I think I count as a millennial, a whole generation who long for authenticity, approachability, collaboration, openness, but who don't really want to hear how it is from a figurehead in a jacket and tie. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) The sinful nature always bristles against authority, but we are in an age, aren't we, where there is something of a wholesale revolt against the very idea of authority, and now enter the preacher of the word of God, set apart for the task, 
by the leadership of the church at which he serves, mandated to study the word, to be mastered by the word, and then to stand before the congregation and proclaim the word, to declare the word, in a real sense acting as the Lord's representative, his instrument to issue his appeal, not to make suggestions to the gathered people, not simply to stimulate a discussion, not primarily to open a debate, but with the authority of God's own word to declare the truth and call for a response. It's an authoritative act, as we've been thinking about. It's got to be a heralding of the word of God. But by its very nature, this kind of preaching will rub up against our culture in a very serious and a very significant way. And if we're at all sensitive to our cultural context, we must feel something of that. We must recognize something of that. It's a headwind. It's a challenge. But we do have a mandate. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. There is a charge and a mandate from God himself for the preacher to declare his word, to herald it, as we've been thinking about, to do so lovingly and patiently, with the, but with the kind of declarative force that will allow even rebuke and exhortation. And the call there, you'll notice it is to do so in season and out of season. And it may seem, I think I feel, that in some ways in the West, we are out of season. We're out of season. It's a tough season. But we recognize, don't we, our highest accountability is to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, who will judge us and who will judge our hearers. And we need to stick doggedly to the task he's given us. And of course, the Lord in his kindness is still pleased to bless the preaching of his word. I see that in my own congregation. I see people listening humbly, gratefully feeding on the word of God. I see the Lord Jesus Christ bringing new life, changing lives. It feels like it shouldn't really be happening in Canada in 2022 with all that's going on, but it happens. The word of God is still sufficient for ministry. The word is still powerful. Preaching still works. Cuts across time and culture. I'm amazed how it still works, but there's still a response. Okay, so we need to give ourselves to the task. And now thirdly, and this is where I want to focus in this lecture primarily, we need to give careful consideration to contexts. Contexts. And by contexts here, I mean the various contexts of the passage of Scripture that we are preaching. Context, I believe, is key if we are to preach the heart of the text and reach the heart of the hearer. The more I go on preaching in my own limited experience, the more I see that context is key. We need to give very, very careful attention to context and a number of different types of context. Let me mention them. Context number one, historical context of the text. We need to take seriously the fact that there is a historical rootedness to the revelation of God in Scripture. He has made himself known on the public pages of human history. He has revealed himself in time and space. This is so unlike other, every other world religion, by the way. You know, you think of Islam and the so-called night of power and the reception of a, of a revelation in a cave, one man on his own. That's the key event in, in revelation in Islam. It's an unverifiable act. It's not rooted in, in the development of history. But isn't scripture so unlike that? Isn't the way in which our God functions so unlike that? He speaks into history. He declares what is happening and what is to come. And then he does it. And then he sends along another prophet and he says, I did it. And this is what's happening now. And this is what is to come. And then he does it. And then supremely, he sends his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, into time and space and history. And he lives and breathes and walks among us and teaches He dies as he promises to die, and he rises again in victory over the grave. Resurrection. There's a historical rootedness in all these things. So we must take seriously history as we study the word. When in history is this section of the word of God rooted? What is going on in the wider world? What is going on in Israel? Where are we within the development of the salvation plan of God and within his plan for the world and the cosmos? It is an act of humble 
submission to the way in which God has revealed himself uh, to take seriously the historical context in which he has revealed himself. Context number two, the theological context of a passage of scripture, which, by which I really mean the biblical context. We need to take seriously both the discipline of biblical theology, which traces the development of the great themes of the Bible over time as they find their, their culmination in Jesus Christ, in his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return. We need to take seriously the discipline of systematic theology rooted in Scripture to understand core doctrines as they are taught us in the Bible and across the Bible. We need to give ourselves to these things and to have a developed understanding of the framework of both biblical and systematic theology. How does, as we encounter a particular doctrine in the passage that we are given to teach, how does the wider teaching of Scripture limit, delineate, sharpen, constrain, enlighten my theological handling of this particular text? We need to be thinking theologically, and that means thinking across the whole spectrum of the canon of Scripture. Context number three, book context. It's interesting to me as I reflect on evangelical history to note the fact that there was a significant period of time when I don't think evangelical Bible teachers took very seriously the notion that the revelation of God was given to us in discrete books. So um, think about... Uh, Bible teaching in the Victorian era and in the first half of the 20th century. Think of a preacher like Charles Spurgeon. He was representative, I think. He was largely a textual preacher. That is, he largely took a verse and preached it. And often he would move between chapters and books of the Bible quite freely from Sunday to Sunday and from occasion to occasion. And the focus would be on pro probably a single verse on many occasions. That was very normal for preaching in that era. Think about how a King James Bible is laid out on the page. If you look at your King James, maybe some have some here, but, but look when you get home. Look at your King James Bible. Most King James Bibles are laid out with a new paragraph start for each verse. Each new verse is indented. And the reason for this is, I think, that the assumption was that the unit of revelation was the verse, the text, the individual thought. Think about devotional aids over that period of time as well. I'm talking the Victorian era, uh, first half of the 20th century. We can go further back into Reformation history as well. Uh, I think perhaps the most published evangelical devotional aid, maybe in English language history, is a little book called The Daily Light on the Daily Path. I don't know if anyone here ever had a daily light on a daily path. They were ubiquitous in a period of time in evangelical history, 100 years ago or so. Now, the daily light on the daily path, which was very widely used by evangelicals as a daily devotion, uh, you'll, you'll find one somewhere in a used bookshop. But if you look at it, what you discover is that there's a, there's, a, there's a page for the morning and a page for the evening. And on each page, what you have is a selection of verses from across the canon, normally single verses, which have been brought together because they have some thematic overlap. And obvious, often it's quite lovely, but you need to know the stories behind the text to make any sense of it. But, but still, the thought there is that the individual unit of revelation is the verse. And because of that, then, verses can be ripped out of books, and we don't need to think about books so carefully as literary wholes and units. Of course, this didn't start in the Victorian era. We can even, we can even go back to the Reformation era, and we can note, for instance that even, even the great Calvin himself was interested in the production of a harmony of the Gospels, drawing together all the material from the four Gospels into a chronological harmony in a single document. You, you see, the, the thought was in that period of time, well, we've got, we've got four collections of events, but wouldn't it be helpful if we, if we took them out of those, those collections and put them together into something more coherent? you know, an entire, an entire whole, a, a complete narrative that is linear and chronological. Now, in that kind of thinking, in that kind of thinking, you are assuming that the book is an accident of history and it's the substance within the book we need. But I think there has been, I'm, and I'm sure of this actually, and the, the scholars in the room can confirm this in terms of literary analyses of scripture that have been ongoing over the last 50 years, but we have, we have started taking much more seriously whole Bible books 
And it seems to me it's very, very important that we do that because God has given us his revelation in books and they are put together very intelligently and theologically and creatively and beautifully. We need to think about the whole book context when we come to study the scriptures. We need to think about genre. What is the, what is the genre of the Bible book I am considering? And what are the conventions that govern that genre within scripture? How is it meant to function? What are the particular characteristics of Old Testament narrative? Of a psalm? Of a book of wisdom? Of a gospel? Of an epistle? Of an apocalypse? What, what, are, what are the conventions that help me to understand how to read this text as a particular genre, as a particular book? I think we need to give careful consideration to the book context. And I think it's rather helpful. We always got our students in London to try and sit back and to identify what we used to call the melodic line of a, of a Bible book, or, or we might say the theme tune of a Bible book. So when we come to study a new book, it's really, it's a great discipline. I'd commend this to you. Stand back and ask, what is the theme tune of this book? I mean, it, there will be all kinds of things that are within the book, all kinds of subjects covered. But if I, if I had to say, what is the thing to which the author comes back to? You know, you, there might be riffs all over the place and, and um, excurses musically, but what, what is the theme tune, the melodic line that the writer always returns to? What is at the very heart of this book? And I'd like to suggest to you that the exercise of saying, look, Hebrews is essentially, if I just stand back from the book as a whole, it's essentially about this. It's essentially teaching this truth. Or, or Exodus, you know, there's so much going on there, but essentially it is teaching this truth. And I think for each book in the canon, we could give a summary statement of its theme tune, of its central theme, that would be distinct from every other book. They overlap, of course, because they're all in the Bible. They're all God's book. But we could say, what is, what is the distinctive contribution of this book in the canon? And, and I'm sure you could all do that very, very well for any book you're studying. But the exercise of standing back and saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a moment, I'm going to try and articulate that. What that does is it shifts gear to get you thinking about book context as you prepare to teach a book and then dig into an individual passage. And it means that you're not, you know, not lost, not seeing the wood for the trees. You're seeing the big picture and the micro picture. And I think that's very, very important, the book context. Context number four, immediate literary context. When we're in a rush, we so often fail to do this well. So there are some well-worn examples of this, um, which I could point to and mention. 1 Corinthians 13 is a very classic, classic uh, example of this. You know, 1 Corinthians 13, it's a lovely, you know, poem to love and uh, very often pressed into service in grand occasions like weddings. I won't ask for a show of hands for those who had this at their wedding, um, but it's very, very lovely. Uh, and some other great occasions, I remember this being read very memorably and beautifully by British Prime Minister Tony Blair at Princess Diana's funeral. Be just beautiful. We had no idea what the passage was about, but it sounded lovely. Um, and, and so we, we press this into service as this great sort of hymn to love, poem to love. But of course, when we set 1 Corinthians 13 in its context within the 1 Corinthian letter, it is before a celebration of love, it is first a stinging rebuke because the Corinthians have not been loving toward one another. Think of, you know, chapter 11 and the Lord's Supper. Some of you go ahead and others are left hungry. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Profoundly unloving behavior. And then you think about the spiritual gifts in chapter 12, and one is saying to the other, I don't need you because you're not of this, and you're not of that. Your gifts don't matter. And Paul's saying, no, 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 that's not the way the body works. And, and then the, the consideration of spiritual gifts and how to use them appropriately in, in chapter 14 and ensuring that it's edifying, not selfish, not, not self-aggrandizement when we use our gifts. And the, the, in, in Corinth, there's, a, there's this profound lack of love in the exercise of gifts and in body life and in church life. And chapter 13 is not, first of all, a celebration. It is a rebuke. <laughs> if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love. That's what's going on. But it, it, it's decontextualized much of the time, actually. Much, most of the time, I would say. 1 Corinthians 13 is, is ripped from context. But when you see it in context, immediately you start saying, oh, the application for this. Oh, my goodness, I see it. I see it. You know, in terms of church life, 
in terms of the exercise of gifts, in terms of caring for one another within the body of Christ, I see it. And it takes on a whole new life, the life I think it was meant to have. Matthew chapter 4, maybe you'd like to turn to this even. This, I'm thinking of the temptation narrative in the wilderness. Uh, very, very famous. I won't, I won't read it because of time because it's so very, very familiar. I'll just begin it. Matthew 4 and verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now, if proper attention to the context saves us from misapplication of the text in 1 Corinthians 13. Proper attention to the context saves us from a superficial and a me-centered reading of the text here in Matthew 4. So what is the classic way in which this text is taught and preached? How have we heard it? How maybe have we preached it? I will give you a brief summary, and you can tell me if I'm way off track here. Matthew chapter 4 is such a help because it teaches us how to fight off the devil in times of personal temptation through quoting scripture at him. Am I wrong? Okay. Well, maybe it does teach us that, maybe it doesn't, but I'd like to venture the suggestion that that is not the primary purpose of the text. And contexts will help us. How will context help us? Wider theological context? Well, that's very interesting we've got some resonances with the wider story of Scripture. We notice that Jesus is called the Son of God here. Where is uh, the first occasion when anyone is called God's Son in Scripture? It's an interesting thing to consider. Where does this idea find its rooting in the Old Testament? Well, I think I'm right in saying that Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 to 23, is the first time we encounter this. And it happens to be very relevant for Matthew chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 to 23. Moses in Egypt, God giving him instructions. 4.22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. That's interesting. And then as we consider the shape of the narrative, Jesus is in the wilderness being tested for a time of 40. That has some resonances in the Old Testament, actually in the book of Exodus, doesn't it, as it happens? You see, how, how, did, uh, how did Israel do? How did God's firstborn son do during that time of testing in the wilderness? Not profoundly well. It was not a successful test. And what we've got going on in Matthew chapter 4, interestingly enough, is Jesus is being presented as the fulfillment of the calling of the Son, the fulfillment of the calling of the nation. And we've seen that already in the early chapters of Matthew, if we're paying attention to it. So in chapter 2 and verse 15, in the infancy narrative, Jesus remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Hosea 11 and verse 1, out of Egypt I called my son, referring initially to Israel as a whole, now referring to Jesus the son. What's going on in this text? Well, Jesus is being presented to us as the son of faithfulness, who enters into the calling of sonship and will go now into a time of trial, a time of testing in a wilderness for a period of 40. And what we discover as we read the story is that Jesus is entirely faithful wholly successful within that calling. Okay, what is this doing then within the book of Matthew? Why is this here? With, within Matthew as a book, why is this important? Well, what is Matthew all about? And what is the book doing? We notice here that Jesus is about to embark on his public ministry. You'll notice the next heading, at least in my ESV Bible, is that Jesus begins his ministry. Verse 12 is the start of the public ministry. How does Jesus' faithfulness to the calling of sonship, his lack of failure, his lack of sin, prepare us to receive his public ministry? Well, I think it tells us that we can trust what he's about to do and what he's about to say. This is setting up Jesus as one to whom we must listen, 
one whom we must trust. That's central to what's going on here. It must be. It has been said before, and this was Martin Collar in the late 19th century with reference to Mark's gospel. I think it's true of all the, all the gospels. Collar said that Mark's gospel was essentially a passion narrative with an extended introduction. I love that. And I think it's true of all the gospels. All the gospels, I believe, are cross-centered. And it seems to me that everything that Jesus says and everything that Jesus does, all the miracles, all the teaching units within the gospels before the cross are preparing us to understand the cross. All the miracles point to the cross in one way or another. That's the only way to make sense of them. And so if, if we take that insight, which I think is a fair one, and we apply that to this incident here, we ask the question, how does this help us to prepare for the cross, to receive the message of the cross, to trust in the work of the cross? Well, what do you need for the cross to work? What kind of a sacrifice do you need for it to be acceptable? You need a perfect sacrifice, don't you? You need a sinless sacrifice. And in terms of preparing us for the atonement, for the passion, for the cross, what Matthew 4 in the wilderness is doing is telling us that Jesus is the perfect one, the sinless one, so that when he goes to the cross, we can say his atonement for us will be sufficient, will be acceptable. We can trust in the work of the cross. So what's the, what's the wilderness temptation narrative doing? It's preparing us to trust the teaching ministry of Jesus, to receive from him, and it is preparing us to trust the atoning work of Jesus at the cross. And you look at the shape of Matthew as a gospel, and you say, well, that's very helpful to have that at the beginning of the book. That makes a great deal of sense. Now, what I'm trying to illustrate here is the fact that paying some attention to contexts has just delivered us from a me-centered reading of the book that says, I need a manual to deal with my sin problem and how to deal with the devil giving me trouble. Here I go. I'm going to quote scripture like Jesus quoted scripture. There's no gospel in that. That's self-help Christianity. And it's not what the text is primarily doing. Now, you may say, in, way down the track in application, you may say in a, in a drive sense, Jesus, knowing that Jesus is the faithful one who teaches me and the faithful one who saves me at the cross, and knowing that I am now in Christ, I learn to live like Christ lived in this world, and maybe there is something here about strategy, but that's way down the track. That is not primary. You see, the text is about Jesus, not about me. And that's one of the hardest lessons we, ha we have to learn. Jesus is the hero of the story. The text is about him. It's not about me in the first instance. So context will deliver us from that kind of superficiality. Uh, it will stop us getting lost in the text. It will stop us making superficial applications. It will stop us making me-centered applications. And if we had time, we could talk about it more, but I think we're going to give time to Q&A, so I will draw to a close. Paying attention to the structure of the text as well as a literary unit will keep us from being lost with reference to proper application. And I will simply reference this, and then I'm going to stop for questions, and you can press me further on it if you want to. Um, Hebrews. Hebrews is a very interesting study with respect to text structure. And it is one place where we seem to struggle very much to take seriously the structural units that the writer has given us. I'll just mention this to you. You can take it away and think about it. Uh, Hebrews is very, very rich. It's very, very deep. It's hard to teach. And many of us have found it very, very difficult. You get these blocks of immense theology. Jesus, you know, in chapter one, greater than the angels, the supreme son, and, it's, and, and all, all these quotations from the Psalms and so on. And you think, what do I do with this? It's big, but I don't know what it's about. And so you, you, you take chapter one and you try and teach it, and then you struggle with it a little bit. And then next week you come back and you start chapter 2 with, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. And then we move to another subject um, and a slightly different angle on the incarnation of Christ and the atonement and so on. And we struggle to know exactly how to apply that. But we, we, we battle through chapter 2, and we finish our sermon, and we get thoroughly depressed by Sunday night because we don't really know what the text is about. And we feel like the sermon didn't land anywhere, and we start thinking we're going to start looking at the job adverts for something we can actually do. Uh, 
And then anyway, we, we sort of, you know, some people encourage us and we get a good night's sleep and we think, okay, I'm going to keep at the job for another week. And uh, so Monday morning, we start work on Hebrews chapter three and we notice it begins with a therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest and so on. And then we get into the stuff about Moses and rest and so on. And we have another rough Sunday. And on it continues. Um, one thing I would notice about Hebrews is that the exhortation, therefore, let us do something. In English, we would normally expect uh, words like that to be the conclusion and response from an argument that's already been made. And what I would suggest in Hebrews, if we ignore the chapter divisions, which were added later, so we are okay ignoring them. It's not some sort of heresy. Those aren't originally part of the inspired text. If we, for a moment, ignore the chapter divisions and put the therefore let us with the stuff that came before, not what comes after, it makes great sense of the text. And, and, and we just need to pause and think structurally about how the text is functioning. And you know what? When you talk about Jesus being greater than the angels and so high and so exalted and so wonderful, to one, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard. Jesus is the glorious son of heaven. You better listen to him. That makes some sense. And I, I, I won't go through, but you go through and look at the teaching material followed by the exhortation, put them together, ignore the chapter divisions, and you got something wonderful to preach. And, and, and you're less likely to quit on Monday. Okay, I must stop there. I must stop there because I didn't, I didn't give time for Q&A last time. Dr. Housen, please help us out here. Do I get to sit down this time or no? I stay up oh, here. You stay right okay, there. Stay. <laughs> okay, what we have is two microphones here. So if you could just come up to the microphones. If you have a question, uh, I will also be looking here on uh, line for those who might want to ask a question uh, from there. So anyone to start? So. Testing. You've answered all their questions. This is wonderful. I'll sit down. Uh, my name is Lars Jansen. I'm from Central Baptist Church. Uh, this is fantastic, by the way. I really appreciate your ministry, uh, Dr. Griffiths. Thank you. Uh, in Ephesians 4, um, I actually just had to write a, a question about prophecy and how, it, how it, the continuation happens nowadays, uh, how we see prophets. And I was wondering, in the list of the gifts God has given us, um, he lists apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. How would you uh, show the continuity with apostles, prophets in that very list? Because the shepherds and teachers are mentioned as well, and you showed that continuity. But how about apostles, prophets, evangelists? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're... I'll try, I'll try and say something coherent here, and I probably need to sit down and remember some of my thought processes on that. I don't think I want to take every reference to prophet in the scriptures and apply that uncritically to the ongoing work of the preacher or the office of the pastor teacher. So I would, I would tend to say that here in Ephesians 4, the prophets are in view are foundational characters, uh, with respect to the writing of the New Testament scriptures. And I think if I gave it a little bit more thought and remembered some of my cross-references on that, because I have wrestled with that a little bit, I think we can see that within the shape of Ephesians, that seems likely. I think there is a reference in chapter 2, isn't there? Built on the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. 22, I think. Yeah. Uh, 20, isn't it? Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So it seems to me that we're talking about those who came alongside the apostles in the writing of the New Testament probably there, rather than an ongoing, an ongoing office. So what I want to say with respect to prophecy is I think that's why I use the language of a biblical theological line of continuity. There is a, a tone and a shape and a character to the work that has a prophetic edge to it and stands in a line, but I don't know that I would want to, as an office, call, it, call, call a preacher a prophet, if that makes sense. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Does that mean you disagree with John MacArthur? Oh, is that what John says? <laughs> I, take, I take it all back. <laughs> Look, just don't tell him. Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm, my name is Josh Stanley. I'm a senior college student here, and then I'm also an intern at a church. And so I'm kind of just jumping back to, the, to your first lecture um, when you talked about what is preaching. Um, as much as I would have loved for every single person in my church to be here to understand what is preaching, and so we can say, you know, this is why we gather on Sundays, and this is why we're going to come and sit under the teaching of our pastors. Um, I mean, not all of our congregations are here, so how would you, how, how would you uh, help someone, I mean, I guess like me or, or like us, to take this back to our congregations and kind of explain to them lovingly, like, this is why we come on Sunday mornings, and this is why we sit under the teachings of our pastor um, without... Um, without seemingly becoming puffed up and saying, you know, you need to all come listen to me. Like, how do we lovingly express the uniqueness of preaching and how it reflects the gospel and how it stands um, in a theological line with the prophetic ministry? And how do we do that? Um, how do we explain that to either people that are in our churches who just think, I'm just going to come on Sunday morning because it's what we've been doing, or to someone who's brand new to church and thinking, okay, why do I, like, why should I be listening to this person? That's a great question, brother. I, I think, I, I think... The strategy is twofold. We've got to teach on these things, part one. And part two, we have to, we have to do them with a God-given convictional confidence. And people who don't fully understand when they see will grow in their appreciation and understanding. Um, but, but I would say, you know, teaching 2 Timothy from time to time, you know, the mandate there that is given for a set-apart ministry is very, very clear, and that is an unusually helpful book to teach on, to build in some of the convictions surrounding gospel ministry. But then just go and do it, and do it well, and what will happen is a, 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 a congregation will gather around you who recognize that God is speaking through the preaching of his word. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Aaron from Brockton Community Church. Do you make a distinction between preaching and teaching, and how would you elaborate on that? Yeah, I would. Uh, great, great question. That's very good. It's a very good question. Um, I notice in 2 Timothy 4, in the charge there, that we get an overlap and a distinction, I think. I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge living the dead, by his period, etc. Verse two, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Teaching is part, it's, it's at the very core. So I, I mean, all that we've been saying before, you know, preaching is by its definition an opening up of the word of God so that God will speak. And at the very core of that involves some teaching of what the text is saying. But there, will, there was this plague in Britain. Um, it, was good, it was very popular 10 years ago where... The idea had kind of gone round, and I mentioned, I referenced this a little bit uh, in, the, in the lecture, but that preaching simply was teaching. There was no distinction. Preaching simply was explanation. And so the service leader in evangelical churches, this became very common. Everyone was doing it. Um, the service leader would say, and now, you know, so-and-so, they didn't say pastor so-and-so, it wasn't British, but, but now so-and-so will come and explain the passage to us. And you come up ready to preach, having been introduced as the guy who's going to you know, give an instruction manual for what this passage is, is about. And, and of course, that's a very bare understanding of what the nature of the exercise is. So preaching is a declaration, an authoritative, public, God-ordained, by someone who's been set apart to do it, declaration of the Word of God. Within that declaration, at its foundation, there is patient teaching. But it is not simply teaching. It goes beyond teaching to an exhortation. I would say. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Kyle Rora from Temple Baptist Church here in Cambridge. Uh, I think this teaching on uh, learning the context just wildly important. Thank you so much. I'm curious uh, what sort of work practically you do, like before you get into real time preaching and study, what sort of work do you do ahead of time to prepare for teaching through a book um, in terms of like, so, you know, like what, how much time do you devote? How much, uh, or uh, like, what sort of context are you wanting to get ahead of time? Yeah, 
in my dreams or in reality? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Thanks, brother. In reality, you know what it's like, right? You're, you have all kinds of grand intentions, and the weeks go by, and the crises mount, and you just got to do it. Um, I mean, if I, you know, if I have opportunity, I, I do love to do some foundational work on a book, and, and if I'm in really good shape, I will sit down, read the thing through well, spend some time with good introductory guides. You know, even like the ESV Study Bible introductory essays are great, things like that, but whatever I can get my hands on to start me off. And I love to try and articulate the melodic line, say, what is this book really about? Uh, and then if I really have time and I'm doing very, very well, I will open up a document on my computer that will be, you know, Titus or Exodus or whatever, and I will, I will, I will have a small number of headings, who, what, where, why, and when. Uh, Roger Kipling, in his Just So Stories, said, everything I know I learned from five wise men, who, what, where, why, and when. And I try and remember that, because actually sitting down and asking the question, who are the key characters in this text, and forcing myself to write them down as I read through the text, just my own observation, who are the key characters here? Well, I've, you know, maybe I got Paul, and maybe I got Titus or Timothy, maybe I got some false teachers who are coming in, maybe I got, you know, whoever, Demas, who in love with this world is, or whoever it is. Uh, what kind of document? What what kind of document is this, and what are its key themes, genre, and content? Where where was Paul? Where was who or whoever? Where uh, when? Any chronology I can gather that may be very brief, and then why? That's the million dollar question. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the next lecture. But why was this document written? And if I have an answer to that question, I know I'm I'm going to get somewhere in the sermon series. Thanks. Hi, I'm Steve Lambert from Toronto for Baptist Church. Um, just mentioning the melodic line, I, f I have found that really helpful too, um, reading it from other places. But like, you go to 3 John, you can find the melodic there pretty quickly because it's a short book. You know, Luke's really helpful in Acts with his purpose statement and refrain that he keeps going back to the word of God spreading. But, you know, what are some strategies that you, like if you're going to preach from Isaiah or, you know, something that's long and you get lost in the woods, how, how would you go about trying to find the melodic line in a, a larger book or a harder book like that? Well, I haven't quite plucked up the courage to preach Isaiah yet, so that's part of my answer. Um, there are some strategies, I think, that can be employed. Um, you, it's very interesting. Biblical writers are good communicators. And one strategy that is unusually helpful, and this sounds really cheesy, okay, and you can write this off and ignore this, um, in Britain, we used to say you should top and tail a book. That is, give some real attention to the opening and the closing of the book, even the first 10 verses, the closing 10 verses. This works better in some genre than in others, but I think it works in most genre to an extent. So good communication. I mean, I remember being taught how to write an essay. We all remember this, right? You're taught, say what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you told them, that, right? And... Um, the biblical writers actually do give attention to the opening and the closing of the books. P.T. O'Brien, who's a New Testament scholar I particularly appreciate, uh, Australian, he did his PhD on Paul's introductory thanksgivings in his epistles. It's published by Brill or someone very reputable, and it was, it was quite a PhD. And his contention was that uh, Paul in his epistles, you see, we, we ignore the thanksgivings. That's the bit we gloss over till we get to the meat, right? And we don't quite know what to do with them. And O'Brien's contention was, if you trace the main themes of the introductory thanksgivings, you have found the heart of the book. That's interesting pastorally, by the way, because it means that Paul prayed through the things he was going to teach to these people before he taught them. That's rather nice. Um, it was started in, in prayer. But, but the, the point was there, in the epistles, if you look at the opening 10 verses and you really get to grips with them, you probably got to grips with the core of the book. I think if, you, if you're really in a rush and you want a brand new book, in an hour, get the melodic line, top and tail it, spend, spend real time in the opening and the closing, and you know, read through it as best you can with the who, what, where, why, and when. And I think you can write something of substance relatively quickly that will give you a roadmap. Great. Or you can just use John or uh, uh, Dr. Don Carson's introduction to the book. Yeah, right, you could steal it too, that would be fun. <laughs> yeah. 
I think that's where we'll end right now. Uh, time for another break. Sorry, maybe in the next session. A couple of things uh, to note is uh, I want to thank the sponsors of this conference, and that is uh, Deeks Insurance and also Faith Life. And also, I want to make it just a little bit of an advert here, and that is that uh, maybe you're a pastor and you've been thinking about maybe doing some more education. Uh, maybe you have an undergraduate Bible degree and you're thinking of something else. Um, please contact us. We have the Master of Theological Studies and the Master of Divinity, and you can do that as many do it, just doing a course a semester and getting through over years, but that's okay. You're learning along the way, and that's the important thing. We also have some certificates. I don't know if all of you would be aware of them, but we have one on preaching that Dr. Reed does. That's a five course, one, one course per semester. So it takes five different semesters. We also have counseling, biblical counseling. That has been a very popular uh, one for both pastors and lay people. And then we have one women in ministry, which is uh, led by uh, Dr. Linda Reed. And so if you're interested in any of those three, I would encourage you to contact our registrar, uh, Karen Mowbray. We are, we are planning on introducing two more one is on church planning, a five-course uh, certificate on church planning, starting, we hope, in January. Uh, so if you know anyone who's interested in church planning, uh, Tom Haynes is going to be leading that of, the, of Fed Central. And the other one is chaplaincy. We find that there are many, many chaplains in our fellowship but most of them don't have any formal education, uh, Bible education. And so we're going to start, hopefully next uh, fall, this chaplaincy uh, certificate. And maybe you can think of, if you're a pastor, some people that could be chaplains uh, or could maybe uh, already be in chaplaincy and that they could take this course and you as a church might help them out financially with that. Okay, we will come back in 20 minutes. That'll give you a little bit of time to do your whatever and be back at three o'clock and we will go for another hour, which will include some Q&A as well. <laughs>